Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Global Civil Society in the COVID-19 Era. For those of you who are returning candid webinar participants, a warm welcome back. And to those of you who are here for the first time, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Cevada, and I'm a program specialist for Candid based in our New York Learning Center. Along with my colleagues, Catalina Spinel and Inga Ingolfsen, will be supporting today's webinar behind the scenes. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we wanted to share a bit about Candid with you. GuideStar and Foundation Center came together last year in February to form this new nonprofit organization. Every year, millions of nonprofits spend trillions of dollars around the world. Candid finds out where that money comes from, where it goes, and why it matters. We believe that an effective social sector is critical for a thriving society, and we believe in the importance of solutions for the sector by the sector. Through research, collaboration, and training, Candid connects people who want to change the world with the resources they need to do it. You can learn more about what it took to become Candid in our very first annual report, and we'll share the link in the chat momentarily. We also wanna take a moment to say thank you for being part of Candid's learning community. We recognize that this may be a challenging time for many, and Candid has shifted its key learning opportunities to a virtual format to be able to accommodate you. You can check out more of them online and again, we'll be sharing the links that you'll see on the screen here in just a moment. We've also invested in providing the social sector with the resources they need to make informed decisions about today's more pressing issues. We have a variety of resources on COVID-19 as well as on racial equity. Before we get started with today's presentation, I do wanna do a quick poll to get a sense of who is joining us for today's conversation. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. And our question today is simply, what region is your organization's work focused in? And this is a select all that apply question. So if you work across multiple regions, definitely let us know. Our options here are the Americas, Africa, Europe, Asia and Oceania, and global. We do acknowledge that these selections are not perfect, but we're working within the limitations of our webinar platform here today. So it looks like I have just over 75% of the room participating in our poll. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this and share the results. That way everyone kind of knows who is here in the room and hopefully this will help our panel tailor their commentary for today. And it looks like we have most of our folks here with 66% representing the Americas. 27% have also reported that they're doing global work, but it's really great to see representation across Africa, Europe, and across uh, the Asian and continents in Oceania as well. So with that, I'll go ahead and hide our results here. And I'd now like to hand things over to my colleague, Lauren Bradford, who will be our moderator for today's presentation so she can introduce our panel. Lauren, I'll have you turn on your webcam and introduce everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Welcome everyone. <clears throat> it's great to have you all here today. My name is Lauren Bradford and I'm the Senior Director of Global Partnerships at Candid. And today we're going to try and help you better understand the changes and impacts as a result of COVID-19 and what this means for civil society now and in the future. We will start by giving you an overview of the funding and survey response landscape and then do a deeper dive with a civil society organization and a funder. So with that, I'm grateful to be joined today by three expert partners. Deegan Ali, Executive Director of ADESO, Gabby Boyer, Representative for Mexico and Nicaragua Inter-America Foundation, and Rich Frommer, Managing Director at LINK. Their bios can be found on the sign-up page for today's webinar. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So, Candid and COVID-19. As Elizabeth mentioned briefly, Candid created a pop-up web page to get you the information that you need to do good during the novel coronavirus pandemic, which you can access for free at candid.org slash coronavirus. Our site includes the latest funding going toward the pandemic, a list of available funds, a list of RFPs, as well as news from the field. We are also collecting a list of global resources on COVID funding as we come across them. Next slide, please. 
this is a map of funding flows that we are tracking that have been directed towards COVID-19 and you can find this map on our coronavirus pop-up page and you can filter by area served, by location, by subject area, um, funder, recipient, etc. So I'd encourage everyone on the call to have a play around with that to understand how funding is being directed during COVID. Next slide, please. So what are we seeing so far? Well, as of today, we've collected funding data totaling $11.4 billion from over 6,000 grants, pledges and commitments. This number is updated on a daily basis, so you can check back to get more updated figures. These figures are primarily from US foundations, companies and notable individuals, but we're also working to capture the most complete picture of international funding and local fundraising campaigns related to the immediate and long-term effects of the pandemic. The best way for you to see that full picture is by sharing your data with us or encouraging other organizations and partners to share the data so that we can build out that complete picture. We've tracked over 830 funds being created and that list is growing. Funds targeting geographic regions rather than specific population groups have been the focus. And most of the funding seems to be concentrated in the US and China based on the available data. So again, that's an incomplete picture and that is because that data is the most accessible to us. Companies and their foundations account for 63% of the funding and 71 of the recipients are multiple or not actually named. Next slide, please. So in order to better understand what's going on with COVID right now, in addition to the funding data, which only tells part of the story, we noticed that there were a lot of surveys being issued by organizations, all types of organizations. So we decided to undertake a global analysis of surveys, essentially a survey of surveys that have been circulated within philanthropy and civil society to get an overall sense of what the common challenges, experiences and needs are around the world and across regions, as well as the types of questions being asked. We've analysed 49 surveys from 47 organisations. 23 of these were issued by organisations based outside the US and 26 from within. Issuing organisations were a mix of member-based philanthropy support, consultants, intermediaries, although I don't love that word, I'll acknowledge that now, um, community foundations, DAFs, academia and corporates. And respondents included CSOs, public charities and funders, as well as individual donors. Most of these surveys were completed in March or April and link survey, which is going to be discussed on this webinar, was also included in our set. Next slide, please. You can see here the geographic focus of the surveys. This isn't a complete representation of the world, but again, it's based on the best available data. So the surveys that were shared with us when we put a call out or that we were able to find online or through partners. So you can see we have a pretty good representation, I think. Um, there are obviously gaps still across regions. You can see uh, East Africa Philanthropy Network is represented here, Peace Direct, Charities Aid Foundation, uh, SEMEFI in Mexico, Jupe in Brazil, uh, the European Foundation Center, uh, TUSEV in Turkey, and some other great partner organizations. So we're really, really grateful for this information and data. Next slide, please. So we found from this survey of surveys, the impact on the field is, of course, globally, COVID-19 is negatively impacting programs and operations. And there are a couple of stats here that I won't focus on now, but you can look at in the recording later in the interest of time. Uh, next slide, please. Financial constraints are top of mind. Of course, that's not surprising. Organizations are worried about limited savings and cash reserves, reduced income from fee-for-fee fee for service programs, and they anticipate experiencing reduced philanthropic giving. Next slide, please. 
We found that organizations have changed the way they operate during the crisis, canceling events, of course, implementing remote work strategies, raising awareness with partners, and developing health action plans. Next slide, please. But many are concerned over the sustainability and future of their work. They're uncertain about <laughs> financial future and the focus of the work. And many organizations are worried that they do not have technological capacity or tools to carry out work remotely. And that can be all sorts of issues from access to computers to internet bandwidth. Next slide, please. Funders are responding in many ways and anticipate increasing and maintaining funding through providing new support in response to the crisis, including launching new initiatives, increasing flexibility around reporting and payment schedules, and collaborating with stakeholders and pulling resources. Next slide, please. And so as a result, we found that funders are being asked by constituencies to provide sustained and flexible financial support for short-term immediate needs and long-term needs, listen to and communicate with their constituents, share best practices for remote work and provide resourcing for switching to remote work and form alliances and collaborate on strategy, ensuring non-COVID-19 related program funding continues. So that is a high level survey of survey findings and information on funding data and now I'm going to turn to Rich at Link. So Rich, Link works closely with local organizations around the world, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And it's great to see that we have our representatives from those regions on the call today. And you recently conducted a survey with these organizations about their experiences during COVID-19. Could you please share with us your findings and key questions that resulted from this research? Of course. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Thanks to everyone. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today and particularly glad that this discussion is taking place. It's it's certainly important for us all to have the opportunity not just to see what some of the impacts uh, of COVID-19 have been on global civil society, but to talk about the concerns that those organizations have themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just Quickly, again, my name is Rich Bromer and I'm uh, Managing Director at LINK. LINK uh, is an organization that's focused in particular on locally led development and locally led social change. Uh, we believe that when local stakeholders who are affected by the change that's, that's being made are the leaders of that change, uh, the, the activities are both more effective and more sustainable. Um, we work using a systems thinking lens in particular uh, in order to really change the root causes and uh, to help both the local organizations as well as international NGOs and donors to uh, create more lasting change. Um, so that involves us working directly with those local organizations, institutions, or enterprises, as well as helping international NGOs and donors to understand how can they more effectively engage those local stakeholders. Uh, next slide. So among the, the work that we do is research and we have been uh, conducting research with the uh, civil society organizations in low and middle income countries uh, really since the end of March when we all recognized that this pandemic was going to have a significant impact. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific study that Lauren has mentioned and that was included in some of the information that she presented. Uh, this was a self-funded study that we conducted uh, to survey our network of civil society organizations globally. Next slide, please. So just a quick landscape. Uh, we, th this particular survey included 125 civil society organizations from 14 countries in Latin America, Europe, Asia and Africa, uh, you could see that the, the organizations cut across a wide range of technical areas and specialties. Um, but I want to make sure, make sure to point out that um, these are established civil society organizations that have been around for at least a few years and many of them for 50 or more years. Uh, they, but they do tend to be a bit smaller, more grassroots organizations. So. Uh, most of the ones that we surveyed were 20 or fewer staff members. 
Next slide, please. Um, and then just, I think the results that we've had are very similar to what Lauren presented. And frankly, I don't think will be surprising to anyone who's uh, alive in the world today, because basically what we're seeing is that uh, the pandemic has been devastating to civil society organizations around the world. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time presenting some of those findings, but just wanna highlight a couple things real quick. Um, one is, as Lauren mentioned, organizations are really uh, finding it challenging to work remotely uh, for a variety of reasons, and, but in particular, a lot of their programs really require them to get out to the field and they don't always have technology or other skills and, and resources to be able to do that safely. Um, they, all of the organizations that we spoke with uh, have taken some measures to cut costs and are particularly concerned about what they're going to have to do next. And I think the most jarring piece of information that we saw was that almost 50% of organizations said that they would have to close under the current conditions uh, if they don't find additional funding soon. So that I think states just how serious the, the issue is. Next slide, please. Um, but despite all of that, we were heartened to see that almost 65% of the civil society organizations that we spoke with reported providing services to respond directly to the coronavirus. Um, and also kudos to the donors who um, conducted their own outreach, uh, we saw that a good number of the organizations we spoke with had their donors, their existing donors, contact them to understand how they could provide more support and how they could increase their response to coronavirus. But we did also see a lot of organizations finding innovative ways to fund their own response, whether that's mobilizing in-kind donations or other donations from their local community, um, or forming partnerships with other organizations that are trying to work with the same constituents. Uh, next slide, please. So again, not terribly surprising. And as, as we've said, uh, we know that the impact is significant and we all want to help uh, the civil society organization survive and thrive and, and provide adequate response to this situation. Um, but the question is really, what can we do to help? So we asked a series of questions as well to those organizations about what the international community might be able to do to help. Not surprisingly, uh, a lot of the, the focus was on financial response, but it was good to see that a lot of organizations also recognize the need for some specific technical advice or equipment, uh, as well as uh, a need for more collaboration and information sharing. Um, next slide, please. And then we also asked the organizations to let us know what some of their concerns and suggestions were, and then what questions they had for the international community. So first, I'm gonna just quickly touch on a, a few of the concerns and suggestions that again, might be kind of obvious. They're things that we've all been talking about for a long time. Uh, number one, that unrestricted and flexible funding is really important for organizations to both uh, manage their own resilience, especially at a time uh, like this where funding becomes more uncertain, but it also allows them to be quicker in response to the changing needs on the ground. Uh, we've also seen that uh, there's there's real value in having funding that exists already in pools closer to these grassroots organizations. So that could be local foundations or community foundations uh, or reserve or emergency funding that's available when something like this takes place. Uh, so that's another area where uh, civil society organizations specifically pointed out that things can change and, and should change. Um, and then another one that I want to point out, which is really a, a top of mind, is that a lot of the common and serious development problems that organizations have been working on for decades are being deprioritized as funding shifts towards pandemic response. And organizations are just concerned about what that's going to mean in the long run. Next slide, please. And then in terms of the questions that 
uh, organizations posed for the international community, you know, again, a lot of the focus was on funding organization. And some of these questions, I think Lauren already started to discuss and, and Candid has been very vocal about trying to get information out around where funding is available. So clearly a key is just understanding um, where where is this funding and how are they able to access it? Uh, again, there were a number of questions around these shifting donor priorities. Uh, the keys being, you know, what is happening to longer term development projects and funding? And what are the long term strategies that donors have uh, as we come out of the pandemic to make sure that we don't see lots of backsliding or that we're able to catch up on uh, the serious problems that organizations fight on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and then there were a number of operations, management, and, and programmatic questions that organizations had, in particular around working remotely, keeping their staff and their communities safe during the coronavirus, uh, but also they're very concerned about how do they keep their costs manageable during a time where uh, funding has been decreasing for them. So I'm gonna wrap up here, um, but I'm really, Again, glad that we're able to have this conversation and hopeful that we're gonna be able to touch on some of these, these questions. Um, just two other things real quick. One is we, the report is available both in, the, um, in this webinar window, but on our website. And um, if you have answers or to, to these types of questions that uh, you can help us to link to from our website, we've also got a page dedicated to that and we'd be happy to take those and add your responses to, to uh, ours. Thanks, Lauren. Great, thank you, Rich. I think that's really impressive and useful information for the field. And we're really lucky to have Deegan here and Gabby to try to start to answer some of these questions as well and share perspectives. Um, so with that, I'd like to go to Deegan next if she's here. Um, Deegan had to duck out briefly. So Deegan, are you there now or not? I'll just give you a minute. Okay, Deegan may not be online in this moment, so that's okay. We're going to go straight to Gabby. Um, so if we can just go forward to the next slide and next slide perfect thank you okay so gabby uh rich has shared some key questions and experiences from implementing organizations on the ground as to what they need and the challenges they feel they are facing during and as a result of covid19 so as a funder IAF, iaf has had to respond quickly and adapt to a new funding norm both in terms of how you as a foundation work and in how you can best support your grantees during these unprecedented times. Can you please share with us a little about how your response and strategy has changed across Latin America and how this will also support philanthropy and civil society to build back better? Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, very interesting uh, presentation by uh, Rick. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, uh, foundation representative, uh, we, as the Inter-American Foundation, was created by U.S. Congress as an alternative to traditional aid assistance in 1969. Um, so we uh, explore uh, our model is a distinct model of direct support uh, for grassroots uh, development in Latin America and the Caribbean, helping communities uh, help the, themselves. Um, uh, we are in about 24 countries, and we have uh, 295 uh, uh, partners in the region. Um, and our investment, uh, active investment, is about $84 million. Uh, but our partners, for every dollar that we bring in, our partners bring in a dollar 31. So we we see ourselves as co-investors. Um, so we're not a disaster relief organization. We are uh, uh, we support uh, grassroots and civil society organizations directly. We have 50 years of experience in responding to local organizations that happen to be 
in disaster prone areas as, as it is in this one instance. Um, so we've quickly throughout, through all the hurricanes, earthquakes, et cetera, we've learned to uh, listen and be responsive to the challenges on the ground. Um, our first response is to let grantee partners re, uh, sort of uh, reprogram funds or repurpose funds in case of such emergencies. Um, now, in, in terms of COVID specifically, um, we've, because of all this experience, we've learned to be nimble and responsive. Um, and uh, we consulted, uh, just like other donors have, we've consulted over 275 grantee partners in the region in late March to assess uh, how to best address the, the pandemic in their communities. Um, most of them responded, about 80%, uh, and most of them, uh, a lot of them identify sort of immediate needs, uh, such as food aid or economic support for participants. Um, over a third of the, the grantees had already mobilized to engage munis municipal leaders, uh, private sector, that we're addressing uh, also and helping uh, community issues. So four trends I would say have sort of uh, emerged. Uh, we are looking at this via the lens of a multi-pronged strategy on how to address COVID-19. Um, so we can't just look at it, you know, respond to the emergency, uh, but in different, uh, in different stages, uh, first, we see our partners as the first responders. And as funders, we want to make sure to continue uh, to strengthen the agency on the ground of our partners and not necessarily disempower them. Um, for example, our, in Brazil, one of our partners that works with violence survivors was producing high value clothing. In the wake of COVID, they quickly pivoted to producing thousands of reusable cloth masks, both for sale and free distribution. We also encourage what I mentioned before, reprogramming, which could be also uh, what Rick mentioned, which is flex, uh, covering flexible uh, operational cost. Reprogramming is basically, uh, in some cases, our grantees may have our IF monies in the bank account. The IF has had this in their toolkit where essentially the grantee comes back to us and says, we have this emergency. We're still uh, um, trying to uh, achieve our goals, but we need to readjust some of the activities. Can we repurpose that money to adjust those activities? And absolutely, if there's a justification there, of course, our partners will. Um, we also, at another level we're looking at is investing in recovery activities. Uh, as we, we're seeing a lot of these uh, economies devastated uh, because of quarantine guidelines, uh, and uh, as the, the economies open up, schools open up, uh, we, we are seeing our, our, the economies uh, trying uh, to uh, catch up with what was there before. So, for example, a Peruvian grantee uh, dedicated to cacao production has worked with government representatives to negotiate uh, for cacao producers the access, uh, access to their farms and processing facilities. And one, uh, one last stage that, that we, we always have to keep in mind is, is the long-term resilience of communities. Um, to, be, to be addressing these long-term shocks. Um, a, a quickly, a second trend that we see is that institutional philanthropic uh, foundations in Latin America and the Caribbean 
are responding very quickly, more so than in other disasters. Um, business, corporate foundations, private foundations, community foundations have mobilized to not just address the health effects, but the social and economic effects of COVID-19. Uh, again, we can point to the social justice network in Brazil that quickly responded to its members to readjust the focus in light of the pandemic. Uh, the third trend is the funding and rootedness and reinvestment. Um, we are seeing that grantees want to make sure to keep funding in their communities, fund local initiatives, local exchanges, that exchange of knowledge peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, and locally purchased, purchased food to revamp their community, um, or the, the economy. Um, and the fourth trend is, as Link, uh, Link mentioned, uh, Rick mentioned earlier from Link, is to keep uh, civil society organizations open. They have to keep, we have to keep them open. We have to keep them functioning by covering operational costs. So like in, in the, in just, the essence is we've learned to listen and to be flexible. Um, Great, thank you, Gabby. Um, okay, so if have you touched on the main points you'd like to touch on for now? Um, those are the three trends that I see. I see. Um, also some three sort of global challenges colliding um, in terms of, uh, in, in light of the current situation. I mean, obviously the first one is COVID-19, which is immediately impacting everyone, not just in terms of health, but economic and social, but it's also, uh, uh, the context of the closing space of civil society, uh, which is uh, an ongoing trend globally that has had been going on well before COVID. And um, it's, it means the harassment and in some cases, uh, murder of indigenous or civil society activists who are leading campaigns to improve their communities' well-beings. And then as a third uh, sort of challenge, uh, you know, we see, and I think you touched upon it, and, and uh, a growing social discontent in response to the econ economic price crisis that in part has been accelerated by COVID-19. And so the pandemic has shed light on a lot of inequities between the rich and poor, especially in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and, and among those who are most marginalized, uh, indigenous communities who lack services from local or central governments, and Afro-Latino communities who have been historically marginalized uh, in the region. And, um, and between that and those who traditional have held power, um, as in terms of sort of what fund us, we are doing in terms of responding and shifting our strategy, uh, we're, you know, thoughtfully emphasizing an emergency response that is, is uh, locally led, and we're seeing our partners as co-investors of that effort. We're not alone in this, and our, our partners are there with us. Um, the, we're letting, we, we have always let organizations design the initiative while ensuring oversight, of course, but not only from us, but also from the community. Uh, the, you know, the, the, when there's a, a non-governmental organization on the ground, they know that the community is watching. And um, at the same time, the, uh, we, in this juncture, we are, uh, we are ever more engaging local funders and elevating local expertise. 
So um, besides the challenge grant fund in Brazil, uh, we have seen other responses, for example, in Mexico by the network of Mexican community foundations that are about 16 members. Uh, they have pulled together a, um, a, fun, a challenge grant fund in response to COVID, uh, which stimulates local grant giving from the bottom up, from local funders that wouldn't have maybe uh, decide, uh, decided to give a grant to a local community organization, and and they're responding to local responding to local priorities. So with a small percentage, because we are funding part of it and our partners at the Mott Foundation are as well, but it's a very tiny percentage. Um, what we're able to do is encourage national donors and local donors to give most of the funding uh, uh, for those community responses. Um, in addition, it, it investing in, in, in infrastructure uh, or increased market access uh, has paid dividends for us. Um, grantees usually who work, we've seen, at least from our experience, uh, and I'm, I have seen it with other donors as well, that if you build resilience uh, before the emergency with communities, um, you're bound to see those communities when they face that next emergency a lot better prepared. Uh, and we saw it in one case, uh, for example, in, in Honduras, where uh, the arid areas of Honduras uh, have been dealing with sort of emergency and drought forever, they seem to have been better prepared uh, now with the COVID crisis. Um, right. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Gabby. Um, and I think the reminder of this is about long-term resilience and long-term shocks is a really important uh, thing for us to all keep in mind and how sort of the cracks in the system have really come to light as a result of COVID um, and has raised many other issues that we perhaps haven't tackled so successfully in the past that we also need to tackle now as well. So really thrilled to hear of the great work and how IAF is mm -hmm. responding. Um, I'm gonna to go to Deegan now, um, so she can sort of build on this local perspective and the locally led perspective. Deegan, hopefully your Wi-Fi is working. So we've now seen the candid data, we've seen um, where funding is flowing in response to COVID-19. We've seen the results of what Link Survey has uncovered um, and the important questions that civil society is seeking answers to. And Gabby started to touch on how they, as IAF, as a funder, is responding. So it would be really great um, as a leader who very directly understands the needs and challenges of civil society, both in East Africa and your work globally for the NEAR Network, can you please share with us firsthand your reflections on what civil society is really experiencing, uh, perhaps some reflections on Gabby's remarks just now, um, and really what the sector needs to continue to support local communities through this pandemic and its wide reaching consequences. And it would be great also to hear your thoughts on the distribution of power and resources within global civil society as a result of COVID. So Deegan, over to you. Uh, Deegan, you might be on mute. And we'll just bear with Deegan. She's having a few Wi-Fi challenges, I think, today as well. Deegan, it looks like you're there and off mute now. Deegan, can you hear me? Okay, I'm just gonna Hi, give it. Well, Deegan reconnects her audio because it looks like that may have cut out. Um, perhaps we wanted to pose one of the questions that came in from registration, but 
I'm looking and it looks like Deegan may be back with us. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. My Wi-Fi is not so great today. Um, yeah, so uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, so yeah, I think that's just a lot of what um, Rich has already said and Gabby and yourself, Lauren, I mean, I think it resonates with us what we're seeing on the ground in the communities. Um, three months ago when all of this started in March, um, basically we saw um, most of the UN and international NGO staff, expat staff, had to leave because of duty of care concerns. And um, so we weren't sure what's actually going to happen on the ground and what was going to, um, what the next three months, what would unfold. But what has become clear is that the funding situation is actually even worse than pre-COVID days where um, almost 70, over 70%, I think about 75% of bilateral funding um, has gone to UN agencies globally. Um, and the remaining has gone to international INGOs and less than 0.2% is going to civil society organizations on the ground. This is the funding from uh, that's being tracked by the UN and that's going from bilaterals, the USAID, just the DFITs and all of that. And so it's just kind of um, COVID, uh, I think has just um, all of our efforts and work that we've been doing in the past 10 years to shift power to civil society in the global south. Um, it's shown that with COVID, maybe the donors have actually become even more risk averse. I don't know why for some reason, but it seems. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, can I can you hear, hear me. You. Yeah. It seems um, a bit uh, morally kind of irresponsible to be fundraising as UN agencies and international NGOs, knowing that you don't really have the footprint or the boots on the ground, you don't, um, uh, that you've evacuated most of your staff and the national staff of many of these agencies have been told to stay home uh, because of concerns around COVID. So, um, at the same time, there's a huge fundraising effort taking place in the capitals in global north countries, whether Geneva or New York. So there is a huge disconnect between the reality on the ground and what we're seeing and the whole fundraising and, and, and where the funding is going. And um, as civil society, for instance, in Somalia, one of the most fragile countries in the world um, that has experienced the only country that has experienced two famines in modern history, um, but it just shows you the existing vulnerabilities in the country. We decided that as um, civil society to come together and do our own kind of um, uh, pulling our own resources together uh, to do uh, COVID response for our communities uh, using the religious communities, religious leaders, using volunteers and medical doctors from the US and Canada. Um, there's a whole fundraising campaign that's being done for crowdfunding. Um, so I think this, uh, for me, what I'm hearing from Gabby and what we're experiencing here on this side, I actually think that one of the best things to come out of COVID really is a sense of recognition of um, civil society and the communities that they really only have themselves to depend on and, and, uh, and less of a sense of helplessness and, and just waiting for money to come from the outside and people recognizing that they're alone and they have to pull their resources together and do whatever they can for their for themselves and their community. So I think that is probably one of the best uh, consequence of COVID. And I hope that trend just increases and we see less, uh, less of this dependency that we have experienced for 40, 50 years of, of a, a global international aid um, and that we see more of this sense of uh, pulling our resources together and really relying heavily on local driven resources. So I think um, that's just uh, a reflection of what we're seeing. But in terms of like the way forward and what do we need to do post COVID, I mean, the link research and what I'm talking about is, is, is and the realities we're seeing on the ground is reconfirming the link research that, you know, majority of the things that are needed are resource driven. 
and the lack of resources. And I think if the global north is really serious about supporting not only civil society in their own respective countries, uh, but also supporting civil society in the global south, there has to be serious structural changes to the ecosystem that allows more funding to flow directly without intermediaries, without these uh, three, four, five layers of intermediaries directly to civil society in the global south. And we really need to have uh, a reckoning with the existing structure and realize that we do need to make some serious investments in, um, in building the pipes and the, pi uh, and the infrastructure for that new ecosystem. It can't just be a lot of rhetoric. It can't just be a lot of you know, talk, and, but we actually have to put the mechanisms in place to make that happen because we know there are challenges for foundations and bilateral donors in the global north in figuring out who's out there, who can they support. Um, they might have restrictions about 501c3 and all of those things. They might have restrictions around their due diligence. We understand these realities, but these realities are not an excuse for um, continuing uh, to perpetuate these structures of serious financial inequalities and uh, resourcing for global south civil society. Let me pause there. Lauren, I believe you're still on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry about that, Deegan. So thank you for those remarks and making those points as eloquently as ever. And again, I, I think you're absolutely right. What we're seeing is through COVID, it's highlighting issues, whether societal issues or in this case, structural funding mechanism challenges and how they do and do not work so successfully um, and how they may work to serve one part of the field such as multilaterals, but not another part of the field such as local organizations. And so I almost as a call to action, I'd like to think that that's something that we can all collectively work on. And I am pleased to see that some foundations are talking about going beyond their 5% threshold this year in terms of giving and taking on debt and issuing bonds. And that is certainly one approach. That's still a grant making approach, but it's it's one approach, but we still have to get the money to where it needs to go as well. So Deegan, if you don't mind, I have a we've got a couple of questions that have come in and I'd like to direct one sort of follow-up question immediately to you. And then we'll touch on some of the other questions. And that is, and Gabby started to touch on this as well, sort of the multi-stakeholder response, but how can funders work together to help save vital NGOs and nonprofits around the world at this time and going forward? Yeah, um, well, okay. So I, I think giving more funding is great, as you said, but if that money is still going to the big, um, big uh, multilateral, <laughs> type of northern organizations and not going to the small civil society organization or community-based organization in Haiti or Liberia or Somalia, then I think all of that is, uh, all of that effort is really, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's just more rhetoric. Um, so we really need to substantially see much of these investments going to those organizations who need it the most and not any more intermediaries and pass-throughs. Um, in terms of what can be done, I think, uh, I mean, there are very basic things that can be done. We need to enhance and put more uh, support into the community foundation model. Um, I think we need to be uh, using that foundation that has been ex established with all of these community foundations where they exist in the global south and strengthening them and, and strengthening their effort and going to, let's say, the Haiti Community Foundation and saying, okay, um, I'm Ford, I, for every dollar that you raise, I'm going to match or double. Um, that, le that not only motivates local giving, but it also gives them you know, serious access to resources that they previously didn't have. So I think, I mean, we, so there are just some very practical things that can be done on that side. Um, but not every country has a community foundation. Um, not every country has uh, localized or nationalized funds 
and we need to start thinking about creating those kinds of mechanisms that are led and driven by civil society for civil society um, that also not just do typical long-term development human rights issues, but maybe also tackle humanitarian action and different kinds of things. It could have different windows in different countries based on the context, but really led by civil society and what they think is, is important. And last and, and not least is, is that we really need to start investing in the institutions and not in projects. We need to start thinking about how do I strengthen this organization to be financially resilient and sustainable? And, uh, and how do I help that organization maybe find other funding streams, other income generation streams, reserves, creating a reserve, creating investment funds, whatever it may be. But we, we need to break out of the cycle of dependency that civil society have on two or three donors. And we really need to invest in them uh, and, and them diversifying their funding streams so that if one or two of those donors pull out, that they have the capacity to withstand that. Great, thank you. I think that's a really good, good takeaway for everybody that's listening, uh, both funders and implementing organizations and breaking out of this dependency model is absolutely crucial. And so how can we work collectively to set up self-sustaining revenue models or funds um, being one of those key takeaways. So thank you, Deegan. We have a couple more questions. We have seven minutes left. So I'm gonna ask a question each of Gabby and of Rich. And let's just take a couple of minutes each to answer those so we don't go over time. So Gabby, I'll go to you first. Um, a question has come in about essentially what sectors are foundations most likely to fund post coronavirus? Can you just share a few thoughts with us on that, please? Um, yes. Um, well, the, I mean, for, for us in particular, um, the, the sec, I mean, we'll continue to respond to priorities uh, that come directly from uh, organizations on the ground. Um, if donors were smart, funders were smart, you wouldn't, they would not focus specifically necessarily on just one sector. Uh, we are looking more and more at systems. I mean, the, the, uh, the issues of challenges on the ground are not, cannot be divided into sectors. Uh, what Deegan was referring to earlier as uh, just seeing partners on the ground as co-investors and reframing the conversation between do donor and grantee where communities have specific skin in the game. If they bring in money, they're willing to risk their own volunteer hours, the, their own money to an initiative, they, they are moving forward uh, that idea. So, it, 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 I mean, in terms, you know, if donors were smart, they would uh, focus their strategies uh, in multiple sectors and look more at as uh, more a, a systems approach. Um, I also don't think donor strategies will change all that much post COVID. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, like us, uh, funders will continue to support uh, their partners uh, and, and on what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and just help them adjust given the pandemic context, which is uh, quite challenging, uh, uh, a, a challenging thing to do. Great, okay, I think that's really helpful. Thank you and it will be very interesting to see how funders respond differently um, and how IAF has responded differently as well. So Rich, last question for you before we wrap up. Um, we've got a question about 
what has worked well for civil society operating in a restrictive space to respond to COVID-19 situation? Um, I'm not sure if you were able to gather any feedback on that topic during through the survey. Obviously, there are countries that are operating in these restrictive environments right now. And in fact, as a result of COVID, some countries have become more restrictive, which is also worrying. So just great if you could share a few thoughts on that, please, before we wrap up. Sure, thanks. It is definitely a significant challenge that is out there facing civil society. As you said, uh, we've seen quite a bit of backsliding on some of that restriction over the past a uh, few years anyway, and uh, coronavirus is certainly not helping that case. And in fact, in a lot of uh, cases has provided an opportunity for further restrictions to, to be applied. Um, but I, I do think, number one, we, I mean, just in terms of some of the restrictions specific to coronavirus, we have seen uh, organizations coming up with some, both some creative ways of trying to, to maintain contact with their community, but in particular for organizations that are already part of the community. Um, they've been doing a lot to, uh, for example, since they are on the ground and as Dagan said, um, they are the ones with the most direct contact to the vulnerable populations most in need in response to coronavirus and, uh, and the secondary effects as well. So they've been able to get out into their community uh, either physically or um, through contactless, so to speak, services being provided. Um, they have certainly struggled, you know, we've seen throughout wealthy nations some serious struggles to find uh, PPE that can be used to keep your, your staff safe as they're interacting with communities. So you can imagine in some of these poor communities how challenging that's been. But the other thing that we've seen is just a lot of local heroes, frankly, um, individuals and organizations that are willing to take on some of that risk in order to get out to their communities. But I guess I also just want to go back a bit and reiterate some of the things that I think we've heard over the course of this hour with Dagan and Gabby and, and yourself as well, that uh, there are a number of these systemic changes that I think um, we're, we're starting to have more momentum for, and I'm really hopeful that we, as I guess people have been saying, are able to build back better. Um, we've certainly seen the, uh, the curtain drawn back on a lot of the weaknesses and inequities within our sector, and um, I think the main thing that we need to see change is not to just put more responsibility on those local organizations to change, but to see change in the donor and international NGO community. Uh, their mindset and role needs to change to really empower grassroots uh, response to, to this type of crisis and others in the future. Thank you, Rich. Well, essentially, you've taken the words out of my mouth, but just to wrap up quickly before I hand over to Elizabeth, um, I think we can all very safely agree that uh, coronavirus has been the straw that has broken the camel's back, so to speak has emphasized the systemic gaps and challenges that communities all over the world faced, rich and poor nations. And we must see this as an opportunity to build back better both as society and as philanthropy and civil society and as a whole ecosystem. So with that, I will hand over to Elizabeth again to wrap us up and thank you everyone for joining and to our wonderful speakers who are very privileged to have with us. Yes, thank you all around, Lauren, Rich, Deegan, and Gabriella, uh, for a great conversation today. Before we say goodbye, I did want to share some upcoming opportunities with our participants, particularly for any fundraisers that we do have on the line. Uh, we do have a variety of self-paced e-learning courses, and this is certainly one of our best-selling ones on how to cultivate meaningful relationships with funders. And as we all exist in a digital era, in August, we will have a returning presenter with us speaking to how to increase your digital storytelling to inspire and attract funders as well. You can learn more about these opportunities and other resources that we do have available through our Grantspace newsletter. You can sign up through the link available here as well as through the QR code. This presentation will be provided to you in the follow-up email along with a link to view a recording of today's registration and a short survey that's in there as well. 
We also have our online librarians who can point you towards fundraising, management, and governance resources to get you started on your next project. You can contact them at grantspace.org slash ask us. On behalf of our team here at Candid and our presenters, thank you for joining us today. If you like this webinar, we do hope that you join us again soon and have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Take care.